All right. Uh, welcome to the Winter Nature Challenge Week 8. I can't believe we're on Week 8 already. Uh, but it's, it's really been amazing, uh, and it's been a great partnership um, between these three organizations. And uh, we've been really getting um, so much engagement and uh, getting to know uh, more folks on the South Shore. So that's really amazing. And um, before I turn it over to uh, Brian, I just want to, again, um, thank our longtime sponsor, of this program, Queen Harbors, uh, and then also Mass Cultural Council. Um, we will list all, all the cultural councils that we've received funding from. Um, we are waiting to hear from a couple more, but we really appreciate the Mass Cultural Council and the local cultural council support. Uh, so thank you so much. All right. And Brian, do you want to talk? I, we we um, hit our, our goal uh, just yes. over, um, I think you said close to $1,100. Yeah, yeah, awesome. It's uh, It's been fantastic. Thanks so much, everyone uh, who has um, supported and donated uh, to support programs like this and future programs. So once again, um, uh, at the point of this presentation, there will be a link in the chat uh, as well to this page to donate, uh, or you can text that number, and I'll put that in the chat as well, um, so that you can uh, you can help support programs like this. So all the donations will be split evenly amongst all three organizations. Uh, so your uh, support is, is greatly appreciated, and absolutely, thank you so much for everyone who has supported us, so we can meet our goal. Uh, but it doesn't have to stop there. You can continue to uh, support and. Uh, and donate as well. So thank you all very much for that. Amazing. Oh yeah, awesome. Um, so Gardening Green Expo is going on this year. Uh, virtual talks uh, happening between March 22nd through the 28th. Um, Doug Tallamy will be doing um, one um, coming up, Nature's Best Hope. And uh, if you have, if you're not familiar with Gardening Green, this is a fantastic a um, uh, group of, of discussions and talks and workshops all about uh, gardening green. And uh, there's many different topics that can be involved in that. So more information on that at um, on nsrwa.org. Uh, and you can, you can find out more about what's going on and register for that. So um, it's really excited to see this happening once again. I'm really excited for this one. You know, I have a passion for native plants and uh, I'm really excited. So many great, great, uh, I know Blake is coming back, uh, and Sam Jaffe from the Caterpillar Lab, and then mm -hmm. Doug Tallamy is kicking it off, and then there's a bunch of other recordings um, that you can watch at any time, so that's awesome as well. So, uh, really excited for this. Yes, yeah, the Caterla Caterpillar Lab is worth the price of admission. Mm -hmm among many other things that go on there, the Garden Green Expo. So yes, uh, I'm Doug Lowry. I'll be co-hosting tonight's talk with Brian. I just want to give a little update on our adventures in the wildest places. We are down to the final one. Uh, if you would like to learn about the British Columbia coast this Friday at noon, uh, I'll be talking about uh, a time along that coast of 14 month long expeditions. And uh, I'll really concentrate on the natural history of the coast as well as uh, talk a little bit about since tonight is paddling, uh, there is some uh, paddling involved in that discussion as well. So uh, go to Mass Audubon and check out our online programming if you'd like to join us for that. Again, Friday at noon. Love to see you there. Thanks, Doug. Uh, and I am happy to say that Maple Day weekend is still going to happen. It's going to look very different from uh, our normal Maple Day, but we're so excited. Um, and especially for me, because this was the very last program that we did. Uh, before everything shut down. So this will be our first public program, other than some you know, walks here and there that we've actually done. And so um, I'm getting a little emotional about it actually. Um, 
But on Saturday, um, we have two amazing webinars, um, two speakers that you're familiar with. Uh, we have Jonathan James Perry and Leah Hopkins. Uh, they're doing Wika Pahi, Sap to Sugar. And they're gonna talk about uh, the indigenous culture of maple sugaring and uh, you know, just how important it is to their, um, to their culture. Uh, and then Miss Louise Beaudry um, at 1230 on Saturday, uh, she'll be live from Vermont uh, talking about the science of maple sugaring. Uh, and then on Sunday, we will have guided maple walks. Um, they will be uh, registration uh, pre-registration only, uh, and they will be small groups. Um, and we will have stations set up along the way. Uh, and then um, families who want to take away a packet of activities to do at home will have that opportunity. And again, um, this program is um, made possible by our local cultural councils. And so we're really excited for that. All right. With that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to um, Brian and Doug. I'm really excited about this presentation. I've only paddled on the river a couple of times and, and so, I'm excited to learn a little bit more. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Chris. It looks like, Chris, I think you need to uh, to screen share. Okay. Sorry about that. That's all right. Um, excited about this um, uh, lecture tonight. Um, so I'll be presenting the first part and then I will pass it over to um, Doug. Uh, for the second half. And so both of us have, um, you know, a decent amount of uh, experience. Doug absolutely has uh, <laughs> experience paddling all over the place, certainly more so than me. So um, I'm excited to hear his presentation as well. Um, for those of you who haven't um, had the opportunity to get out on either the North or South Rivers or the Green Harbor River or uh, Jacob's Pond, uh, this is a fantastic, uh, we are incredibly um, uh, you know, fortunate to have several great waterways to be able to um, uh, paddle around and, and experience and explore. And so um, this presentation will um, be sort of a, a um, introduction uh, to get excited to go out. It looks like, I think that is it, Chris. Yep, you should be all set. Sorry about that. No, no worries. No worries at all. All right. Yeah, everyone looks like looks like a rolling. All right, so uh, guide to your very own river adventure uh, with Doug Laurie from Mass Audubon Southeast Region, as well as a uh, Knowles National Outdoor Leadership School instructor, and then myself, uh, the educator with the North South Rivers Watershed Association. Um, so, like as I was saying, the goals of this presentation are an introduction to the rivers, uh, to get interested and get excited, to want to go out and explore via paddling, whether you're a canoe or a kayaker or a stand-up paddleboard. Um, provide you resources to take the next step, uh, or perhaps maybe you want to go on a guided uh, paddle with, with us, or uh, hopefully this summer we will be doing some co-paddles with uh, Mass Audubon and or the Science Center, which would be pretty cool. So this presentation is not an all you need to know for river paddling, okay? So don't watch this and then immediately go out onto the river, okay? There are several things that you'll need to do and to think about before you go, and that's what we're gonna talk about. So this is not an all you need to know. The, the rivers are a beast of their own and there's some things you need to think about before you just grab that boat and go out, all right? Uh, so, um, so I just wanna put that out there. Um, before I get started on some of the details about the rivers, uh, briefly, the North and South Rivers watershed uh, has been working for 51 years uh, to protect these uh, our, the rivers and the water and the land around them. These rivers are beautiful because of the hard work that the organization uh, and, and other organizations like Mass Autumn and like the Science Center um, in instilling passion and excitement for the outdoors. It's because of uh, groups like this that allow us to have places like this. Um, so for 51 years, we just celebrated our 50th anniversary last year. Um, passionate, you know, the NSRWA, basically a passionate group of, of nearly 6,000 individuals, families, businesses, and other environmental organizations through, through, throughout the South Shore uh, that value this, uh, uh, the importance of the water um, for people and for wildlife. It's not just us that want to enjoy this you know, it's not just us that need the water, uh, it's uh, all the other animals, the birds, the fish uh, that need the water as well. So 
really quick, the uh, organization was started by Jean Foley, um, a situate resident who would uh, was a birder and would frequent the salt marshes in and around the North River. And she started to, and this is back in the, um, uh, uh, the late 60s, um, she would start to go out and was not hearing some key species, primarily the salt marsh sparrow, which is pictured down there. Um, uh, and it, it was because she was started to not hear these species that she started to wonder why. Um, and, you know, obviously uh, a snowball effect of, of understanding our humans impact in, in damaging the rivers and how that's causing loss of very important key species like the Salmar Sparrow, that she was able to um, amass a, a larger group of, of passionate um, and, uh, you know, passionate people that were advocating for protection of the land and water. And so uh, it's a very interesting story and there, that story is on our website. So if you wanna go to nswa.org, you can learn sort of a little bit more in depth about the history. So it all starts there. It all starts with one person that uh, uh, is connected with nature that understands something is wrong here and wanted to do something about it. And that's why we have this program right now. So. Uh, there's a dam restoration, restoring na um, natural uh, migratory fish routes, as well as, as their passage, healthy shellfish beds, protecting local, uh, you know, land and wetlands, sustaining wildlife habitats research, all the, a lot of programs. This is just a, a just a very brief um, list of what the NSRWA does. But um, again, visit our website and you can see that we're, there's a lot of really fun uh, and cool things going on. There's a lot of great science happening too. So if you're not familiar with the organization, please check it out. Maybe you'd like to become a member too. Um, so basically, um, you know, we right now, the organization is continuing the work of yesterday, like the, the work from Gene Foley and all the past members um, who have been fighting the issues, uh, fighting those issues today and protecting and preserving our water for tomorrow. All right. So a little bit about the geography of the rivers that we're going to be talking about today. Um, the North and South Rivers watershed encompasses roughly 112 square miles. That's around um, 73,000 acres. In that picture uh, to the right there is um, the NSRWA's program area is in green, but then the actual physical watershed uh, is there in blue. So you can see how broad of a region that is. And so of course a watershed, if you're not familiar, I'm sure everyone here is, but if you're not, a watershed is a large area of land where all the water that enters that area, whether it's ponds, whether it's rain, snow, uh, all that, that area, all that water that enters that area will eventually flow to one place. A lot of the watersheds are named after that one place that all that water eventually goes into, that being, for example, here, the North and South Rivers. Um, and it's all due because of the land's topography, the hills, the valleys, the, the rivers, the ponds, all that creates the water. Water always goes downhill. Uh, and so if you have a hill and a valley, the water is going to start on the hill and work its way down. So that is what creates the watersheds, the watershed boundaries, uh, and that's sort of how it operates. And of course, all of our actions within that watershed can affect the quality of the water within. So, um, so you can see the North River uh, shares its banks with Situate, Norwell, Marshfield, Hanover, Pembroke, and Hanson. Hanson sort of a, with an asterisk, that's actually the Indian Head River, which is one of the main tributaries that joins with the, um, the, the, the Indian Head, which joins with the Herring River to form the North River proper. So. Um, the South River shares its banks with Marshfield and Duxbury. Its headwaters are, are in Duxbury. Um, and so, but of course that other towns are also in that watershed area. Um, you can see Rockland, a little bit of Weymouth, a little bit of Abington in there, Hanson, um, Pembroke as well. So uh, the North River was the first designated scenic river in Massachusetts, 1971. Um, and the North and South River are also designated national natural landmarks um, from the US Park Service in 77. Now, both the North and South Rivers are natural estuaries. They are tidal waterways. So an estuary is where the river meets the sea. It's where fresh water meets salt water. Um, the North and South Rivers both contain brackish water. They also both contain fresh and pure salt water too. So uh, they're a very unique um, environment and something that is rare too, uh, and something that we're losing rapidly uh, in and around the United States. Uh, estuaries have some of our biggest cities built on them. Um, even around the world where rivers meet the sea, it's what made fantastic places to settle because the rivers were great modes of transportation back then. So 
um, a lot of our um, marshes and estuaries have uh, seen some pretty dramatic changes over the past several hundred years. So, um, so, but uh, that's a little introduction to the rivers that we're going to be talking about today. So, so much history. Um, there's more history that could be contained. We could do a whole year long webinar. It's just about specific areas of history. Um, the Wampanoag Native American tribes were the inhabitants of this region um, for thousands of years prior to the European settlers. Uh, and so I am not, I'm nowhere near qualified nor versed to be able to um, properly uh, uh, talk and give the facts that, that I would want to be. There is a lot of great literature out there to read, um, to understand more, um, but I can't by no means go into um, uh, much of this history, uh, any topic really. Um, uh, and so I'll just give a, a very brief <laughs> overview to say the least. So, but back then the rivers were the highway, highways. And when it came to uh, both the travel, um, the, the water, as well as the migratory fish routes, these made for great places for people to settle, um, both uh, the Native Americans and then the, the settlers um, uh, in more recent history. So. Uh, after the Europeans arrival, mid 1600s through the um, 1700s, the old growth forests, which one could only imagine what they once looked like, uh, were cleared, completely clear cut and opened up for farmland. So um, all the trees were removed uh, and the area went through an incredible transition between old growth forest to, um, to farmland and grazeland. Through the mid 1600s, then through the late uh, 1800s, extensive mills, factories and shipbuilding um, sites were along the river's bank. Um, I'm sure everyone lives near a Mill Pond or, or, or Factory Pond or Mill Streets or, or Brick Kiln Lane, you know, something named after a shipyard. So, so it's this, uh, you know, these industrial roots are, are very deep here uh, in, in, the, uh, in the watershed area. A lot of interesting history there as well. And then the early 1900s to the present time, rapid urbanization, residential areas and forest regeneration there's, they say that there are more trees in the area now than there were um, before. Uh, and so, of course, they might be a lot smaller and younger, but um, we are seeing um, definitely sort of forest succession coming back um, uh, and, and going back to somewhat of what it may have once been like. So, like I said, that was just a very, very brief overview. Um, uh, all right. A major event that happened here uh, was the Portland Gale of 1898. And this changed the coastline and the river composition forever. This is a major storm that happened in November um, that changed the, the shape of the rivers. It changed the salinity count, uh, the, the, the amount of salt water, uh, the salt content within the river upstream, um, and it, it changed the geography of the river. So uh, as you can see, the picture on the left is um, prior to the Portland Gale before 1898. And you can see I don't know if you can see that my pointer there, but the mouth of the river is, is down there. Uh, it is down there where Rexan Beach currently is now. So if we go to the picture on the right, this is the current chart of the area, and you can see the river's mouth is between third and fourth cliff is now open. So this this storm was so strong that it breached this new mouth, this what is called the new inlet up here further to the north, and it silted shut. Um, what is now known as Rexham Beach. That's why there's no roads going through there. That's why Hummerock, this sort of, this barrier beach here is still part of Situate because it used to be connected and not to Situate and not connected to Marshfield. Now it's the opposite, but yet it still um, is part of uh, Situate. Is, is still, uh, Hummerock is still part of Situate, whereas Rexham is then part of um, uh, Marshfield. So uh, this was a, a major store named at Portland Gill, named after the ship, the steamer. Uh, Portland, which sank um, with 139 lives aboard. Um, it sank and it's resting there on Stellwagen Bank right now. So, uh, so a huge, huge storm. Uh, there's some great history on that as well. Um, so, but that, uh, uh, when it comes to some of the historic things like the shipbuilding and all that, this was a, a major uh, factor um, in that. And so, all right, shipbuilding on the North River was a major part of the history from the um, around 1678 through um, 1871, very active in shipbuilding. Um, over a thousand ships uh, built uh, with cargo capacity ranging from 30 to 470 tons. Now this is tonnage. This is not this is not the actual weight of the ship. This is the amount of weight that the ship can hold within its hull. Uh, its tonnage, its, its capacity to, to transport. One tonnage 
uh, in this sense is about two, about 2,200 uh, pounds. It's actually the amount of, <laughs> historically it's the amount of weight in wine uh, that a, a boat could carry for tax reasons. But anyway, uh, so major shipbuilding, uh, extensive shipping, of course, with, back in the 1600s, the old growth trees here were what the shipbuilders were looking for, it primarily the white, like huge stands of, of very tall white pine, which make perfect um, masts for ship, soft wood, flexible, uh, will bend rather than break. And so, um, and then they could build the ship's hull um, in river and then um, uh, use the tides to work them out to a coastal shipyard to get its rigging and, and its sail placement and all that. So. Uh, so it made for fantastic, safer areas to build a ship that were protected with all the resources that they needed around. While you're paddling up and down the rivers, you will see uh, on the North River, you will see signs, these historical signs like a picture of one here, placed all throughout. And I know that the Hanover Historical Society uh, had a major role in, in, put, in redoing a lot of these signs and, and putting them up. The signs have been there for a while. And so in uh, each will have information on the particular shipyard that was there at one point, including how many vessels were built in the size and range. And sometimes it'll include some notable names of some ships that were built there. For example, one of them and the Briggs and Hobart's landing shipyard kind of close to Rope Marine and 3A there uh, <clears throat> is the site um, of the, the building site of the Columbia, which is pictured here. And so um, this is a notable ship uh, because this is the first ship um, to circumnavigate the globe under the United States flag. Um, and we're talking, oh geez, I thought the date was on here. This is back in the 1700s. And um, uh, so it's, it's the uh, Columbia, it's not the USS Columbia because this, it was a privately owned ship. It was not a ship that belonged to the United, United States ship, USS. So um, it was the Columbia. It uh, discovered, first discovered and named the Columbia River um, on the west coast of Washington. And also the command module for Apollo 11, uh, which is of course what, to, what um, brought uh, uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin into space, the command module um, uh, was named after the Columbia for Apollo 11. And then also uh, the space shuttle Columbia was named after this ship, of course, that had the incredibly tragic um, end to that uh, space shuttle's um, exploration career. But so um, there's uh, several more ships for the sake of time. I won't go into that, but um, huge amounts of history, world changing history um, of ships that were built here on, on our rivers. All right, tides. Uh, so when it comes to paddling on an estuary on a tidal river, tides are probably the first thing that one would think about. The first thing that someone might think about that might discourage them from going out, but it, it uh, by no means has to be anything that causes someone to be discouraged or worried about going out. It does, however, cause um, someone to think about it and plan accordingly. So um, these rivers are so special, partly because they're tidal. So it's a very different environment from anything that you would find inland. And uh, it can make for some of the most breathtaking views in the area. Um, and so understanding the tides uh, and knowing how to calculate and plan ahead is all you need to do for a successful and incredibly wonderful journey up or down the river. So this is a picture from Google Earth. Uh, and let's just see another picture just a, a couple months later. Boom. All right. So can you see, I'm going to go back and forth a couple times. You can see the difference. So maybe you look at a point, look at the, so this is a driftway. This is on the Herring River, a driftway park in situate. You can see the dock right there, the boardwalk that you can kind of walk out on. It's actually an old gravel, the old dock network for the, um, the old uh, Situate Gravel Company there. Oops, sorry. If I go back and forth, you can see that that boardwalk is now completely out of the water. And you can see there's the channel that goes through. Now, in, if you're looking at charts and things like that, there's only about a foot uh, of water during low tide. So navigating this compared to this, you know, it can be challenging. So knowing the tides is important. Um, you can see there are some of these, these uh, you know, mosquito canals, uh, mosquito dishes that are just completely dry <laughs> during low tide. Um, the, the North and South River, closer to the mouth around this area, uh, it can have about an 8 to 12 foot difference between high and low tide. Um, and uh, it becomes less the further away from the ocean that you get. And, uh, and so average, it's around a 10 foot difference, but that will fluctuate. And we'll, we'll talk about ways that you can figure out um, what's going on to plan ahead. So 
on a grand scale. Uh, technically, the, the tides don't come in and out. Uh, this is sort of like that mind blow kind of, uh, you know, um, part of this. The tides don't come in and out. It's actually the earth, there, there are two bulges of water on the earth um, caused by gravity, the gravitational pull from the moon and the sun. And those, those bulges are always there. And it's the earth that rotates, uh, it, it's the earth that rotates through that. So wherever you are, you're going to rotate through that bulge. The bulges are, are always there. That gravitational pull is always there. So that's why there's two high tides or floods per day and two low tides or ebbs per day. And they can, they can vary in their difference between low and high. Um, and so in addition to the tides, the, the moon's gravitational pull is also slowing down the rotation of the earth that causes the, the leap second. That's a whole different subject. I just thought I'd include that in there. So we're talking stuff on a, on a, a really another worldly scale here. Um, neap tides are like what would be considered a low tide or the smallest difference between low and high water. Um, and so this is when the earth, the moon, and the sun kind of form a right angle. So they're not, the forces aren't in line as opposed to the spring tide, or sometimes referred to as the king tide, is the greatest difference between low and high. So this is where the earth, moon, and sun are in a relative alignment. So it creates a very, very strong, um, a very, very strong pull. Um, and so this generally happens about two times a month, obviously, as, as, as the moon, um, uh, you know, uh, revolves um, around the earth. Um, and same thing with the uh, neat tides. Um, and so slack water is the point that happens um, four times a day, which is where it's right before the tide switches. So right as it's very, as it's its highest point before it goes down or right when it's at low tide before it starts to come back up, it actually, the, the water um, stops moving there for a moment. We'll talk a little bit more about that as it relates to the rivers. So as uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson says, Wherever in the universe you find gravity, uh, you find tides. Interestingly enough, tides also works on solid objects too, but you just don't see the effects as, as much as you do lid. All right, locally, there are monthly uh, charts available online. The, the tide uh, predictions can be predicted for months, years in advance because it can be calculated. Um, but there are some variations, weather related variations, things that, that can create subtle differences. But, you can go and plan a trip two months from now and see the the time of that tide for that day. So you can plan ahead. You, I like to use usharbors.com, um, but there's also fishing for tides. There's several websites that you can do and, and check out um, that are pretty easy to understand. I'll talk a little bit. I'll use US Harbors as, as an example here because it's pretty easy to understand uh, for me. So uh, when you look at tides, you can type in like tide Boston Light Tide or Damon's Point Tide. They are tidal reference points that a lot of the charts will use. There's about a 30 minute difference between the two. We'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, it's an approximately a little over a six hour cycle between high and low. High and low happens twice a day. Um, and so, um, and it's, so it's approximately a little over, it's uh, maybe a little bit closer to 13 hour cycle between high and high. So um, the difference between high and low is six hours. The difference from high to low, then back to high is uh, more, a little over 12 and a half hours, okay? And like I said, the difference in elevation um, is it's about a eight to 12 foot difference between high and low. Um, water. Uh, uh, Anchorage, Alaska, it's about 40 foot difference. And the Bay of Fundy, uh, further up along the Canadian Maritimes, it's about a 50 foot difference. So imagine that. Um, um, okay. So uh, th that is just a very brief, this is a very, uh, you know, uh, elementary introduction to understanding what's going on with ties and how to plan accordingly. Someone, a, a long supporter and volunteer of the organization, Charlie Naif, has done a fantastic Time of the Tides uh, video presentation. Uh, I believe actually it was for a Water Watch lecture series a couple years ago. It's recorded, it's on our website. Um, it was recorded by uh, Harbor Media, Norwell Spotlight TV. So they have that there. He does a, about, it's about an hour, fantastic, very in-depth talk about tides on the North and South River. So if you're to take the next step and you wanna learn more, that's the one to watch. And you can find that on our website as well. Um, a lot of the information that I have here, I have um, uh, taken from his, with permission, of course. <laughs> Thanks, Charlie. All right, um, here is the U.S. Harbors um, page that I will use. 
uh, and you see this, so this is March, and you can see that today, right there, the third Wednesday, right there. Um, so you can see that today uh, on the North River, so this one's at Damon's Point, is the uh, where technically the North River site is. Uh, you can see that, so the first tide today was at two, a little after two in the morning, um, and then the Oops, and then the tide, my sorry, the tide after that would then be this first low tide uh, at about 840 in the morning. And then it would be this high tide at 234 in the afternoon. And then this low tide at nine um, in the uh, at night. So you can kind of see how the chart is laid out and how it progresses. So the first thing that you want to do when you are looking at this chart, find the date find your day, you can see that the, the columns here are under the highs. So this is when these are the times at this particular location on the river, it's gonna be high. And then these are the times at this particular location, the North River at Damon's Point, it will be low. And these feet markers indicate the, um, the height of that. So this is nine, so for example, today at um, two in the morning, it was at 9.7 feet above mean low. So zero would basically be the average of, or the mean of the low tides. Um, and so we, if we go over to the low tide, you can see that it says um, it, it was negative 0.9. That means it was actually 0.9 feet below the mean low um, tide for that area. So you can kind of get a sense of how high the, the tide will be or how low it will be. And low points can, be a great indicator, especially if you're paddling uh, further, like in the upper reaches um, of the North River, where areas where the water can get pretty low, and you really have to uh, be wary of that because there might be some opportunities. Like I'm, like I know I have, and maybe I'm sure Doug has as well, where if we had to get out and walk, uh, or try to bear crawl while sitting in the in the kayak, or do whatever we can to try to get past some obstacles because um, the water might have gotten a little low there. So. Um, so that that is uh, this is where you would want to start when looking now um, this is, of course, these are the tides for that particular area when it comes to oh and this is a graphic that is also on the page too, so you can kind of see how the ebb and the flood. Um, how it's just uh, you know it's a sine wave it's just a curve and it just keeps going up and down up and down like I said about a little over six hour cycle between low and high and 12 hours between the two high points, and then you can see um, on the left there it has the um, the height of the water above the zero being the mean low. Yeah. All right, so um, when you have water that is rising in a river estuary setting, um, that vertical rise and fall of the water level causes horizontal movement of the water called tidal current. So just like similar to a inland river where the, the water is only going one way as a current, in the estuaries, that, that current will reverse as the tides ebb and flood. When the tide is rising in the ocean, the current will be moving upriver in the river, okay? Um, uh, <laughs> with an asterisk by that, because there can be some timing difference, which I'll talk about in the next slide. So, but when the tide is lowering, um, the current will be moving downriver. So if you're at a particular location, and the tide is rising, the current will be moving upriver. If you're staying at a, any location in the river, when the tide is lowering at that spot, the current will be moving downriver, all right? Tidal currents are most noticeable where water is restricted, like bridge passages, okay? Where there are those abutments, like there on the Union Street Bridge pictured below, um, those abutments can create, they bot it bottlenecks the water and it can create some very fast, strong moving currents. Uh, under there. So definitely I know that Doug will talk a little bit about that coming up, um, about things to, to look for. And this is why planning accordingly to the tides is, makes can, can make or break your trip. All right, um, there is a delay. So like I mentioned before, um, if the tide in the ocean is rising, it might not necessarily be rising where you are if you're like far off river. There is a tidal delay. It takes time for the tidal influence of the ocean to make its way upriver. The further you, away you are from the mouth uh, or the new inlet of the river, the longer the tide effects take to be seen to get to you. Sort of like a rubber band, it 
there's some catch up between one side and the other, all right? But this is all easily calculated with this little chart right here, which I stole from Charlie's presentation. <laughs> this actually, this chart is also on our guide maps, which we're giving out all, more information on that uh, to get your hands on one of those. So uh, on the North River, Damon's Point, um, those U.S. Harbor, the chart that I was using before was from Damon's Point. So sometimes you can you can actually take that 20 minutes off and, and take that away from these other calculations. If you want to make it easy, uh, um, uh, you just look up Boston Light and that, then that's when all these would be um, spot on applicable. Now, of course, 20 minutes or, or an hour or two hours, you know, this is rough. The, it can fluctuate slightly, but this will give you the best chance of being of predicting it pretty, um, pretty spot on. So, um, so if we we're talking about, so pretend those charts that we were just looking at were for Boston Light, which you can easily, that's just what you type in. Um, then this is how you would calculate depending on which location you would like to start at or you'd like to go to. Um, to figure out. So, Dame's point, it takes about 20 minutes from the, the ocean tied to those effects to be seen, about a half hour night by uh, on 3A by rote, um, hour and a half where Union Street Bridge is, um, and, and so on. Okay. Uh, and that's because, of course, in the ocean, the tide can just rise up and down, but in a river setting, that mass of water has to work its way back and forth. So, it creates some time, which interestingly enough, can create a point where the water is uh, is pouring out of the mouth of the river, yet still might be rising way back up 12.5 miles up near the crotch of the river because it has such a long distance to go. It doesn't all happen at once. All that energy, all that liquid energy uh, takes some time to catch up to something that's happening miles and miles away, which is another really fascinating part about the river is that you can be up in at the Indian Head launch in Hanover 12 plus miles away from the ocean, but yet the ocean's tidal effects can still be felt there. Uh, and the water is almost completely fresh way up, up river, but yet the, the way that it works with the salt, the salt water, it's, uh, it's very, very fascinating. So, um, so let's do a little example here. Now, again, this is, I, I could spend an hour going through the specifics uh, and helping each individual person plan and understand this. Um, this is just a very basic level. Watch Charlie's presentation to get a better explanation of how this works, uh, or you can email us too. I'd be happy to, I'm happy to, always happy to help out people planning their trips on the river. So, for example, let's just say for the ease of this, um, the Boston Light High Tide is at noon. All right. I would like to do a trip from Union Street to Couch Beach and back. Um, I'd like to do an out and back paddle. That's approximately a six mile trip, three miles down, three miles or three miles up, I should say, and three miles back. Couch, uh, I'm sorry, Union Street is right, I don't know if you can see the pointer right there, all right? And then Couch Beach is right here, okay? About three miles away. Um, uh, so I'm gonna put in at Union Street, and the uh, high tide in the ocean is at noon. So I want to make sure that I get to Couch Beach before the tide switches because I want to be paddling with the tide the entire way. I want the tide to help me upriver and I want it to help me back. I don't want to round the corner by North Reservation by Rocky Reach and be battling against the, 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 um, the slight rapids that it might cause. So I want to make sure that I'm going with the tide in both directions. So if the tide in the ocean is at high at noon, what time do I need to be at Couch Beach by to make sure that I don't, I'm not too late and it switches before I get there? Well, you guessed it. You want to be at Couch Beach by, by before 2 p.m. Um, for me, I would launch at about 11.30. Doug has a, a pretty cool information about how to kind of figure out um, maybe your, uh, you know, think about speed and things like that. I'm going to leave by 11.30. Um, I'm sorry, that says 11.30 p.m. Uh, that's not, that's, I'm uh, sorry, 11, that's 11.30 a.m. I want to leave just before noon from Union Street, so that way I can take my time, enjoy the sights, uh, and get, and make sure, because it'll take me about, usually it takes me about an hour from uh, that route from, from Union Street um, to, uh, and I'm launching on the Marshfield side, so I'm not going under the bridge, um, to launch from there to Couch about an hour for me. Um, and so with the tide, of course, so I can get there. 
I can get there around, you know, maybe around 1230, hang out, have lunch, swim, uh, and enjoy it right there because it's a beautiful place to go. And then around, so because I did this calculation, I know that around two in the afternoon, the tide is going to be at high and it's going to start to switch in reverse directions. And then after it does, then I can, it'll be smooth sailing all the way back to Union Street where I put in. And I just need to make sure that I'm back to Union Street by 730 uh, uh, in the evening because that's when it will be low and start to reverse back in the other direction. So um, obviously I would not, I probably wouldn't be hanging out until that late. Uh, uh, and so, um, uh, but you would still, you'd want to, you know, prepare for uh, just getting, a, you know, a good sense of, of the tides through that, the day that you'll be out. So that way you're not surprised about by anything because there are several points in here where if you're going against the tide, uh, especially some of those bridge crossings, it is almost impossible to get through. And if not, it could be dangerous uh, to try to go against. So, so that is just a brief example. Um, and uh, like I said, this, this title chart calculations, we have this information on our website. You can download um, our, a free kayak and canoe guide that we have, which contains this. And we do have our new, um, charts, which there are brief pictures here, which has a lot more information on them, including this um, chart on there, including the title calculations as well. So um, those resources are both available to you, both digitally and then the hard copy of the map as well, which you never want to go on the river without one, because you never know this has all the shipbuilding and, and cool historical facts on it as well. So um, where to put in? These are the, the great sites to start. Um, the Driftway, which they're in, in Situate in the Heron River, where I had that, that tide um, satellite picture. Um, the boat ramp there fills up pretty quickly in the summertime. So um, there is a access that isn't the actual um, uh, you know, motor boat launch. You can access it. There's a little grassy area, which you can, you can put in as well. Marshfield Canoe Launch on the Marshfield side of Union Street. You can also go on the Norwell side too. Um, there's only a few spots to park and sometimes the gate is closed. You can park on the Marshfield side. Um, Pembroke Canoe Launch off Brick Kiln Road there, very minimal parking there. Um, and so, and I believe it's still, it's still a dirt road access that might be a little rugged. So the Hanover boat launch further up near the, um, the crotch of the river. I know it's, the, the river has a mouth and it has a crotch and it has, you know, so, uh, the Hanover boat launch up there off Indian Head Drive right at the end. That's a great spot to go to explore the upper reaches. Um, on the South River, Rexham Beach, um, uh, in the summertime you have to pay to park there. Um, in the main beach parking, but instead of going over the, the dunes to the ocean side, you go uh, in the other direction, you go west and the South River is right there and it's easy, a very short walk to transport your boat from the parking lot to the South River to launch. Um, it's an easy, easy portage. And then also there is a fantastic South River launch behind CVS off of 139. Um, uh, that is on the old railroad track there. And uh, you can drop your, your boat off there. Technically, you're supposed to then go and park at Levitate, um, uh, but usually there's not a lot of people. I'm, hopefully no CVS employees are watching this right now. I usually just park there because there's no, usually that whole backside lot is, it never has cars in it. So, and it's about a, uh, maybe about a, uh, you know, uh, you know, quarter of a mile walk from the parking lot to the actual launch, which is further down the railroad track. So and that's a great spot to start um, uh, as well. So uh, if you're interested, the Great River Race will be happening this year. It'll be um, a more information on the River Race to come, but it'll be a similar myth style to what we did last year where um, everyone can compete individually or with your small group. Um, hopefully we can soon get back to our huge mass of um, divisions of boats as we, as we all compete against one another. Um, but even not if, if we can't do it like this, uh, in a year or two, um, you can still go out and we will provide you with the information you need to plan and what days and what times would be best. So we have all that planned and we'll send that to people who register for this. So um, more information on the Great River Race to Come, but it's super, super fun. Starts at Union Street Bridge right there and goes to, um, uh, pulls out at the Indian Head. However, you can do a half where you go to Couches Beach and come back to There's two different uh, ways that you can compete this year. More on that to come. Resources. Um, go to our website. We have a lot of historical site specific information, tons of just whatever you're looking for. If it relates to the river, you type it in, you'll find we've got information about it. We do have a free guide map. Those of you uh, who were generous and donated to us during this presentation, you're going to be mailed one. 
Um, and um, if you haven't, we're gonna put a bin out on Friday, at least by Friday, there'll be a bin on the steps of our office. You can grab one of our guide maps, totally free. Um, there's a few books um, that I like to use, The North River um, by John Galuso, who has also been a uh, longtime supporter of the organization as, and it absolutely um, with the, the Y and the Science Center as well. Um, he has written a fantastic um, book, has a lot of history uh, and a lot of nature facts about the river. Good, it's short read, great intro to the North River, fantastic book. Um, in terms of, you know, like Wampanoag history, I've got King Philip's War. It, it's, it's really gritty. I, you know, it's, it's hard to read because um, some of the history, it's really, um, it can be quite upsetting. Um, but um, I have looked into other, um, the people and culture of the Wampanoag by Cassie M. Lawton. I have, haven't been able to read yet. I hear it's really good as is um, this is Their Land by David Silverman. Um, I've been told that those are pretty good reads to get a little bit better of a picture of the um, of Wampanoag Native Americans prior to the Europeans' arrival. Um, and then also, if you're interested in the shipbuilding, um, the history of shipbuilding uh, on the uh, North River uh, is incredibly deep and extensive uh, and has more than enough information that you want. Uh, that, that you could uh, use. So this is, a, it's a great book if you're interested about the, um, the history of shipbuilding on the North, uh, North River, Lloyd Vernon Briggs. Um, Briggs being a familiar name of shipbuilding on the North River as well. So um, the Time of the Ties presentation that I mentioned earlier by Charlie, uh, available on our website through NSTV, it's a fantastic presentation, gets a lot more in depth about the ties. And then also the Hanover and Norwell Historical Societies both have um, have uh, a lot of great information and great people working there uh, to reach out to if you would like to get more specific information about about the area. So um, that is concludes my sort of portion about what I wanted to talk about. I'm going to pass it over to Doug, who has a lot of uh, great uh, information about um, taking the next step in planning your trip. So now that we're excited, now that we're thinking about the tides, um, now we can uh, hear some of Doug's expertise um, to get more into the in-depth about uh, what a trip on the river might look like and what some things you're going to want to think about. All right, so Doug, you can hop in anytime and let me stop my screen share. And um, uh, so if, if um, I have been sending out emails to, to everyone about um, uh, you know, like, for example, after the program, I send emails. So if anyone has any questions about any of this stuff, feel free to send me an email directly. I'm always happy to share and help people plan a trip, um, as I've, I've led quite a few. But also from the organization standpoint, the more people we can safely get out on the river to enjoy, to learn, to explore, and to connect with the water, that's a win for the organization, because that means that that person is more likely to connect and to want to protect that is that uh, that is important to them. So uh, we're always we want to be the resource to get people out there to enjoy this uh, amazing place that we've have worked very hard. We all have worked hard to uh, to protect. So so that's that's why we are there for for that exact reason. So so Doug, whenever you're ready, I I can see the the slide there. It looks it looks like it's still in presenter your view. There we go. There we go. Thank you, Brian. Off we go. So yes, you can't really talk about paddling uh, without talking risk management. And um, certainly we don't want to discourage people from, from paddling on the North and South rivers. If you do your homework, uh, if you have some, uh, some good, well-practiced skills, there's absolutely no reason why you can't paddle the river. Uh, and, and we're gonna give you some information on, on what you should expect uh, from yourself uh, before you venture out, uh, especially if you're gonna take some friends uh, or relatives that don't have the skills you do. We'll kind of try to put, put things on a continuum so you'll feel comfortable what or what you shouldn't do as you paddle. Um, so, uh, what I'm going to cover is a little bit about those skills. Uh, we'll talk about a float plan. We'll give you some ideas of what to, uh, the consequences you might run into and how to mitigate that, how to, how to work around some of the things that are inevitably gonna, you're going to run into on the rivers. Um, 
And then uh, we're going to give you a decision making tool that will really help you make solid sound decisions. And from there, then we'll go uh, into uh, some of the things you can expect to see along the river. So first of all, let's be honest and determine, and this is up to you, uh, you need to self uh, evaluate where you are on this continuum. And there's no, there's no reason uh, not to be proud about any of these uh, situations. If you are a brand new paddler, good on you. Uh, you will be um, heading in a direction that will get you on the river uh, with a few skills uh, and, and, and enjoy yourself for sure. Um, and so here's the breakdown. So a novice would be somebody who's brand new to the, the sport and hasn't had any experience and doesn't really know what to expect from the, the sport or the activity. So uh, why would they, um, why would they even consider uh, doing something on their own? They, they know that, they're, uh, they know where their the kind of their limits are uh, and they shouldn't. Uh, so consciously incompetent, advanced beginner. And uh, this is probably where um, you could probably, you could go out on the river if you consider yourself an advanced beginner, somebody who has done some uh, skills, have, have done a wet exit, whether it's a canoe or kayak, learned how to get back in, how to empty the boat of water, um, what to do with all your equipment, etc. cetera. Um, once you do the homework, an advanced beginner should feel comfortable paddling up and down that river. Um, if you're going to start taking people out, then it's recommended that you are at least competent so that you can take care of yourself, you can take care of others, because so many situations uh, go bad because uh, folks have a variety of skill levels and you can't make a decision based on your ability. You need to base a decision on the person who has the least amount of experiences ability. So that's something that a competent person can do. Uh, and then of course, a proficient or, or an expert, you're thinking about all of these things subconsciously. You, you, not that you can do this in your sleep, uh, but that you, you are totally aware of what's going on at all times. I won't go through everything here, uh, but the ACA, the, the American Canoe Association, is a wonderful resource for learning more about how to plan a trip. Uh, basically, uh, prior planning uh, will make you uh, your trip successful. Uh, that's where all the hard work needs to be done is before you get out in, in the river. You need to understand what your uh, level of, an, of, of exposure is um, and what possible contingency, contingency plans you'll need. Uh, but this, this is a, a good start. And you can go on the ACA's uh, website to look at this. And we're going to talk more about this uh, as we talk about a float plan in just a minute. Basic equipment, safety equipment, you're probably well aware. And some of it is just good common sense and some of it's the law. Uh, so a PFD, um, and I know there's people that, that uh, argue that you don't really need a PFD in the summer. Uh, and, and I strongly disagree. Uh, if you are uh, in a boat in the summer, uh, you can very easily fall out of the boat or have an accident and hit your head, get unconscious, and then the PFD sitting in the boat is doing you absolutely no good. So that, that is why it is a policy uh, that is um, just uh, makes so much sense. And it's why anybody who runs trips, uh, nonprofits or uh, for profit companies, require you to wear a PFD zipped up and well fitted, snug. Um, these are some of the other things you'll want. You'll want a, a paddle that's appropriate for you. Of course, your boat is important. You want, whether you're canoe or, or kayak, kayaking, you want flotation. 
in those boats. You don't want your boat to sink if you fall over. So uh, you would want watertight bulkheaded compartments. And if the boat doesn't provide those, then you should have additional inflatable uh, substitutes that are lashed into a canoe or uh, stuck into the bow and stern of a kayak. Then you'll want all of the, the necessary uh, safety equipment and how to use them. Now, there's a good chance you're not gonna need to, uh, to do a paddle float rescue on the North and South rivers, but it's something that is just uh, one of the basic skills and how to get back into your boat without aid of anybody else. And so that's something you, you'll wanna put on your short list of skill building is how to do that, how to do a wet exit, how to get back in your boat. Um, and then a tow rope is really helpful. Uh, if you need to tow somebody um, uh, for, because that person is incapacitated, it's really nice to have. Other things uh, is yes, your official NSRWA map of the North and South rivers, uh, some sort of uh, communication device. If you are on the, if you are actually on the ocean, uh, then you are required to have a VHF radio. If you're paddling the river, uh, a cell phone is adequate, but it should be obviously kept dry in a dry box or a dry bag. A compass is helpful. Uh, it doesn't take long uh, for somebody to not know where they are to get really lost. Uh, and so the compass helps with that. Of course, extra, extra clothes, uh, food and water, Again, if you're on the ocean, you need to have flares and you need to have some sort of light as well. If, if the Coast Guard pulled you over, uh, they might ask you for all these things. Uh, again, it's a little different on the river, uh, but it's, it, it's smart to bring a headlamp or light just in case uh, things uh, go to the point where you're paddling in the dark. And yes, did we say PFD? Absolutely. Just remember, a PFD is, it doesn't save your life, it keeps you afloat. So, uh, and you cannot put a PFD on while you're in the water, it's, it's near impossible. So have it on, zip it up, put the belt uh, buckles together. Here's a float plan. Um, there's plenty of these uh, around. Uh, Brian and I wanted to make sure we gave a shout out to uh, Doug Gray of Billington Sea Kayak. Uh, he's got an amazing shop down in Plymouth. Uh, it's, it's, it's fun. Uh, if you can find a shop, then you'll know how to read a map on the, on the North River. It's a little tucked out of the way, but it's an amazing place. He has been such a proponent uh, uh, a proponent of the sport of paddling uh, and just incredibly uh, supportive of the organizations, uh, especially watershed associations. Very, very generous individual, uh, a wealth of information. And I believe he has a, a solid uh, float plan uh, out, outlined for you to follow. And basically uh, it's self-explanatory. We won't spend a lot of time on it here, but you should spend a lot of time on it when you put together your program. Uh, so yeah, you'll, you'll basically, essentially you wanna fill it out uh, to the point where uh, if somebody, if you were not coming back at a time you indicated, then somebody would have a very good idea of who you were with, when you were leaving, when you were expected back and where you're likely to be. Uh, just, it makes sense. Uh, and this is something you could leave with somebody that you know, a loved one, uh, or you could even put it in your vehicle if you're leaving the, uh, the vehicle uh, uh, at, a, at a put in or takeout. So yeah, uh, we're gonna see if we can uh, cover a lot of ground here. I, I, I see that we're we're pushing the time here, but I think that some of these things are important. So uh, thanks for your patience and, and ability to stay on a little longer, if, if you will. So the, uh, again, deduce reckoning is a way you can figure out how fast, 
how far uh, and how uh, much time you're going to need to cover ground. And it's uh, simple formulas, but essentially uh, the average paddler, both in canoe and uh, kayak, once they get pretty good proficient at, at a forward stroke, can travel about three nautical miles an hour. And so, uh, so Brian's example of putting in at the Union Street Bridge and going up to Couch Cemetery uh, Beach is dead on. So it's, a, it's a, about a three mile up, which takes an hour and a three mile back, which takes an hour. Um, and so that's one of the first things you're gonna wanna do. And you can do that by taking a piece of string and measuring the contours of the river. There's a lot of oxbows and meanders and you wanna make sure you cover the entire uh, route uh, using a piece of string and then using that string for a scale of miles. Um, and some maps have that scale of miles, some, some don't. Um, we can help you uh, with that if you run into something that doesn't. Uh, oh, and just real quick, oh, we'll talk about it later. So these are places along the, the mouth and inland when you're starting out at the driftway perhaps that you wanna pay attention to. So these are uh, potential safety issues, all right? And uh, basically, if you're out in the mouth of the river, you don't, you, you wanna have the skills to be able to deal with surf, with breaking waves, uh, with uh, cross currents, with clepidus, uh, lots, of, lots of things that you need skills to be in. So we don't recommend it, uh, <laughs> certainly for any beginner, um, it's notorious for having issues. Now don't let that scare you away because again, uh, if, you, if you do your homework, you should be okay. One of my favorite paddles is to put in behind CVS on the South River and time it so that I run all the way down to the new inlet and uh, hit at about slack tide, uh, low tide, and hang out on the spit if you have to wait. And as the tide comes back in, you ride the North River to the Hanover Canoe Launch. So it's, it's a full long day on both rivers, but it, you're using the, the current to your advantage the whole way. It's quite, it's quite fun. But anyway, out here in the, what happens if you get an ebbing tide, a tide that's leaving, uh, and in opposition to the wind, uh, you're gonna get standing waves. And that you don't wanna be in at all. Um, so yeah, unless you uh, uh, are good at surfing and have experience, then don't ever go out there. Plus there's a lot of motor boats that come in and out of there and it's really hard to see kayaks and canoes from uh, a motor boat. Uh, you just, you, you're like a little speed bump. So stay out of their way. Um, let's go up the creek a little bit. And these are places that the, the river narrows. And so, yeah, Brian had alluded to this. And these are the spots uh, in, on this section of the river. Uh, en entering the South River at Third Cliff, it gets restricted and water, uh, remember nature abhors a vacuum. And so water is gonna speed up uh, as it goes through a, a narrow spot like that. And, um, it's something to pay attention to. It's something that you can actually uh, work with, but you got to be aware that it's it's a possibility and be prepared to to uh, to deal with it if if need be. The Julian Street Bridge and the C Street Bridge also uh, restricts the water and it speeds up there and uh, both places. But in my experience, the Julian Street Bridge, in particular, that's the area between the Julian and and uh, C Street Bridge is a, is a pretty healthy muscle bed. And at lower tides, uh, those, some of those muscle beds get exposed and that even uh, moves the water even quicker and you don't wanna run up on top of those muscle beds. 
but essentially, um, let's see if we can get, nah, we won't. So uh, uh, look on the left here, if, if you are opposed, if you're paddling opposed the current, then uh, you're gonna wanna take advantage of the eddies that are created on the outside banks of the river. So uh, water will actually catch on the sides, on the edges of the banks and actually reverse direction. Uh, and so if you need to go across uh, up an area where the current is strong, then stick real close to the, the shore. Uh, use strong, deep strokes and, uh, and power your way through. And if you've got a group, this is a, a classic place where groups can get separated. Uh, once the first person gets through, they keep going. And, and if anybody had issues or trouble going through, uh, you won't know it until it's too late. So find yourself, get through, hang out in an eddy uh, above the restriction and wait for everybody in your party to catch up before you continue. Uh, it just makes, makes it a lot easier to, to have uh, everybody together. So here's a, another potential hazard. Again, if you're paying attention and doing your homework, you shouldn't worry about it. In fact, uh, it makes a fun ride if you time the tide right. So uh, Rocky Reach is an area where it's restricted and it's fairly shallow and there's some rocks exposed. And so, yeah, you actually do can get some rapids. Um, so uh, if you are running with the current, your best bet is to choose a route through, through that slot in the middle of the river. If for any reason you're caught going upstream uh, against the current, then again, use that, those eddies that, uh, that exist. Um, and, and most everybody who's paddled the river several times, or at least up to the Hanover Canoe Launch, uh, has stories about the Washington Street Bridge um, in Pembroke just before 53. It's uh, fairly shallow there and fairly restricted because of the, the nature of the bridge. Um, and uh, it, it, in, a, in a strong current, it's near impossible to go up through it. But you could try, as, again, as long as you're staying uh, close to the edge and that you're pointing your bow in towards the, the bank as you paddle through. If you get your bow uh, out into the current, it's going to spin you right around. Uh, and, and you don't want that because that's, that is when people tip over very often um, uh, because uh, it's instinctive to want to, to turn into the current, but you really need to, to tilt your boat away from the current, uh, something that you'll learn as you, as you uh, progress. And then uh, the Hanover takeout is a, is a great place, but yes, it can be so shallow up there. Sometimes you have to get out and walk your boat, um, which actually works okay uh, because it's pretty solid. Uh, in the last oh, 20 yards before the, the takeout there, uh, it's pretty gravelly. Um, yeah, so those are some uh, some things on the North River. Let's take a minute to focus on the South River. Uh, and yes, Brian alluded to, whoops, sorry, alluded to uh, putting in behind CVS. There's, uh, if you, I wish I get my pointer working, sorry. But if you look down in the lower right-hand corner of this map, you'll see South River Street uh, and then the South River. Uh, and in, so in between Ocean Street and South River Street, you'll see a piece of con conservation land uh, with a lot of bends in the South River and the number 81. That's a little uh, fun little side trip. It's a good place to practice skills uh, and it's worth tucking in there if you want a break. There's actually a place you could um, uh, put your nose of your boat up on solid ground and get out and stretch. Uh, and then, yeah, it's, Rexham Beach is a wonderful spot to get out and stretch or, yeah, 
to connect. And then, yeah, you can, you can, there is a town landing uh, between Julian and C Street Bridge that you can uh, launch from. Uh, you need a sticker, a Marshfield sticker, uh, but in the off season, there's, there's very little competition for space. All right. Um, accident potential. This is pretty standard stuff. There's uh, accidents happen when subjective or human factors intersect with objective or environmental factors. Um, and so, you know, most accidents happen because there's some little something that, that starts a chain that just uh, gets derailed. And so um, some of the things to be really conscious about with human factors are obviously, how, you know, taking care of yourself, making sure you're, you're uh, hydrated. Uh, don't let schedules make uh, a big part of your decision making. Don't be overconfident and do listen to everybody in the group if you're making a decision. If, if uh, a person who is uh, timid or uh, isn't comfortable with what's going on is usually the person less likely to speak up. So make sure that you include everybody's uh, uh, advice and or opinion before you make a decision. And in that way, actually, it, it sets you up for success because uh, with ownership, when people are listened to, then they provide ownership to the decision and help support it. So it just makes sense. Uh, and then of course, there's, there's the environmental factors that you really wanna be aware of. Um, yeah, that, that, that could certainly affect your, uh, your success rate on, on trips. Uh, just be, be aware of all those. All right, here's a couple of things you want to think about. Uh, so yes, uh, speed made good is uh, how fast your boat is actually going. So again, uh, at three knots an hour, um, you're covering about uh, a mile, I'm sorry, um, with, with no current, you're going three knots. Uh, with a, if you're paddling with a two knot current, then you're actually speed made good as five knots. So this is why it pays to look at those tide charts. Uh, and, and then of course, if you misread them, then you are uh, on the treadmill. Uh, uh, if you're going against a two knot current, then you're only going one knot. Um, with the ferry angles, when you're crossing uh, rivers at uh, spots where you need to get into the lee or uh, the the ferry on the other side opposite bank is you want to uh, what we do is call uh, a squirrel across the river or ferry across the river so you're deliberately pointing your boat upstream uh, and paddling like there's no tomorrow and you're going to uh, paddle and cross the river as efficiently as possible. If you just make a beeline for the other bank, opposite bank, then you're going to end up actually uh, going backwards. So be, give that, try this. Uh, when you're out sometime, uh, mess around with, with uh, your, your positioning on the river. If you're going against the current, then hug the banks. If you're going against the wind, then hug the banks. Uh, it's, the rivers are fastest uh, where on the outside uh, turns. Then uh, here's a, a, a decision-making tool that I find really helpful. Uh, so if you consider uh, these four factors with the decision-making triangle, the sea conditions, what is the river doing? Uh, the weather, what is predicted? Uh, use now casting as well. What's happening right now with the weather? Uh, terrain considerations, in other words, with, with the North and South River, terrain considerations would be your, uh, basically your distance and time between safe spots. 
So your commitment level. Um, so you'd want to consider those as well uh, in a decision making. Uh, and one of the ways you can simplify this is if you can look at every one of those components, those four components through a stoplight for each of those components, it really helps you uh, think objectively and clearly. Now, everything gets obviously filtered through human factors because uh, how we respond to the other three factors is ultimately how uh, our decisions gonna either make or break. So do keep in mind where people are at on uh, their, uh, their skill level, their, uh, their health, uh, where are they, are they tired, dehydrated, et cetera. But if, if you get green lights for all four of those components, then yeah, keep going. If you get a couple of green lights and a yellow or two, then yes, you can proceed, but just be real, realizing that things, uh, you wanna be cautious. And if things change, you wanna be able to respond to them. So you're starting to think, all right, what are my contingency plans? Uh, and if you get a red light in any of those quadrants, then you should get off the water uh, as, as soon as possible. All right, noting the time, I'm gonna whip through these here. Uh, seven leave no trace pr principles absolutely uh, should come into play when we're on these rivers. We need to love these rivers. We shouldn't love them to death. Um, so please uh, get familiar with the no trace principles. Uh, there is some, there's some rules and regulations that uh, you need to abide by. For instance, camping at Couch Cemetery uh, you need to get permission from the town of Marshfield, uh, both to, to camp there and also to have a fire there. So you, you need to talk to uh, the fire chief or the fire department, and you need, I believe it's still the DPW to get a permit to, to, uh, to, to camp there. Um, and the other ones are, are pretty self-explanatory. All right, we'll finish up with this. What you might see, uh, just again, uh, I hope Brian and I didn't frighten you away from getting on the river. Uh, that's not our intent. Our intent is just to make you aware of, of how you can make your experience much more pleasant. We're not trying to scare you away. We're trying to convince you that uh, the best way to, to enjoy the river is to, uh, to do your homework first and, and let the the journey be a success because you were prepared. Uh, absolutely amazing sights along the way. Um, these are, I think some of these pictures are taken on trips with the Watershed Association. Here's some blue flag. This is actually on the Green Harbor River, which uh, is within uh, all of our abilities. It, it's not as tidal. We, uh, we can talk to you about the Green Harbor River. This is uh, the cardinal flower, obviously. This is a bog orchid along, along the way. Great bird life. Uh, this is a greater yellow legs uh, down near the shore where, where there's a lot of uh, saltwater influx for sure. Um, and we probably don't have time for this, but uh, let's see if we can get it to Nah, we won't, we'll skip it. It's, uh, just in, um, a lot of migra migratory birds are coming back this way. Uh, so be cautious and conscious about, about that when you're on the river. Uh, there's nestings not too far down the path here. So uh, things like marsh wrens and shorebirds will nest uh, in, in the river. Uh, so just be uh, conscious of, of your uh, presence there. Um, Here's the South River. And here's our nature challenge for you this, this week. Uh, if you could write a float plan for a specific trip that you intend to paddle sometime this spring or summer, uh, be specific as, as which date and, and that you're gonna go and figure the appropriate tide considerations you will need to navigate. And uh, extra, work, extra 
credit for those that have a contingency plan or have a, come up with a uh, rain date for that trip. Um, please uh, don't hesitate to email Brian or I uh, with any advice on trips on the North and South Rivers. Uh, we thank you so much for joining us tonight and uh, sorry we went over time, a lot to cover. Uh, we hope you have found it helpful and we look forward to seeing you on the rivers um, soon enough. That was excellent, Doug. Thanks so much. Yeah. Yeah, thanks so much, Brian. Doug. Brian, we already, we already had a, quite a few messages and questions in the chat function. I'm going to stop sharing and yeah. yeah. Oh, thanks, yeah. everyone. And I knew it, Doug. I knew I would talk too long. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's great information. <laughs> we, if we do this again, we'll do it a two-parter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like Doug said, um, everyone has my email. If anyone has any questions uh, or want to submit the, the challenge, just send it to me. Or going forward, if you have any questions um, about planning a trip this spring or summer, feel free to uh, reach out to Watershed. Uh, we're, we're always encouraging people to go out and connect. Um, and the Green Harbor River or Jacobs Pond are two fantastic places to go. If you're not comfortable on the uh, fast moving, you know, swift water, head to those places where it's a little more controlled, still water environment. Same thing with Billington Sea, kayak. They do lessons here even in rentals. So, um, you know, feel free to, uh, to reach out to them and go um, so that you're a little bit prepared and more comfortable for you go out on, on the uh, fast moving <laughs> waters of the river. So um, well, thank, thanks so much, everyone. Thanks again, Doug and, and Chris. And uh, um, uh, thanks again, everyone. Uh, you'll be sent an email uh, soon uh, with the follow-up. And then this presentation was recorded. So if you missed it or only caught a little bit of it, you'll be able to see it on YouTube uh, shortly. So uh, so that's pretty much all I got. Next week will be the last one and it'll be a presentation uh, by me about geocaching and maybe a little bit about animal tracking as well. And that and you've got what there's something to do with kids uh, out in nature. Uh, definitely tune in uh, next week at the same time uh, to hear about that. So that is all. all right. Got. <laughs> Thanks so much. That was amazing. Have a great week, everyone.